As the ball dropped on New Year's Eve last year, we had a vision for what 2020 would bring. In a matter of months, that crystal clear 2020 vision had become blurry. As our goals and hopes for the year had to be changed, people started to ask, when will we go back to normal? After all, going back to normal would solve all of our problems, right? But what if normal was broken? Let's start this year by looking at things in our life that we hope don't go back to normal. From faith to finances, from relationships to racial divide. Let's move forward instead of going back to the broken normal. Hey there, my name is Josh. I wanna thank you again for joining us for a study session. And as you might know, we're in the midst of a series called Renew Normal. Perhaps you, like me, heard people early on in the pandemic ravaged year of 2020 talking about this idea of returning to normal, or I just want things to go back to normal. And it's totally understandable that people were saying those things. I know I was one of those people saying those things. And what it did was it gave us a light at the end of the tunnel. It gave us something to look forward to because it certainly felt like we were in the midst of something that uh, really had no end in sight. But I think we can all say that right now it feels like momentum is moving in the direction of us moving outside of this pandemic. And so as a result of that, I think it's easy for us to slip back into this idea of returning to normal. But the question is, are there things in our lives that we would rather not have returned to normal. Maybe they weren't all that great to begin with uh, before the pandemic. And now we have the opportunity to reconsider what those things are and whether or not we want to return to the way that they were. So today I'm gonna to be looking at this idea of anxiety. And I think you and I can agree that we have been living in a really anxious time. We've been living in a time of great uncertainty, lots of unknowns, things kind of swirling all around us without seemingly many answers to our questions. In fact, there is a statistic out there that says that in 2019, approximately 8.6% of Americans claim to have some sense of anxiety in their lives. And what's interesting is that in 2020, that number jumped to 36%. Now what's interesting about that number obviously is the increase is significant, but also too the fact that there might be even more people out there who are willing to admit to this sense of anxiety, this sense of unknown and uncertainty. And so we're gonna take a look at a passage in the Bible where we can ask the question, did Jesus actually b battle anxiety? And if so, is it something that we can look to him for as far as what we can do and what we can uh, hold on to when it comes to times of great anxiety? And I wanna preface this by saying that I'm focusing in specifically on the kind of the spiritual formation aspects of this question. It has nothing to do with whether or not we should be in counseling, whether or not we should be receiving therapy, whether or not we should be on medication. All of those things are a part of the answer when it comes to anxiety. My focus this, this time around is really gonna be more on kind of the spiritual side of it. And so I would really encourage you if, you feel, if you're feeling an overwhelming sense of anxiety and it just doesn't seem to be going away, it might be time for you to contact and to reach out to professionals who can help you answer those questions and help you receive the help that you need. So like I said, we're gonna be taking a look at a specific part of scripture where we find Jesus and he is, um, I think he's well aware that his time on earth is coming to an end. He is in the garden of Gethsemane and he has brought a couple of his disciples with him. 
And I think from this passage, we can learn a lot about how Jesus battled anxiety. It's interesting because Jesus is fully human in this moment. And so he is feeling all the feelings and he's feeling, I think, a great sense of anxiety. And what he does is kind of the perfect response to that sense of uncertainty. And it's something that we can learn a lot from. So there are four things that I'm going to be looking at specifically for us to consider how we might be able to battle anxiety from a spiritual perspective. And then I'm going to offer one suggestion at the end of our time of how we might be able to, um, to move forward in this idea of anxiety and, uh, and find hopefully something on the other side that is much more life-giving and uh, a lot less uh, scary. So if you would turn with me to Mark 14, and we're going to be looking at verses 34 or excuse me, 32 through 41. And I'm going to be reading bits and pieces of it as we go here. And I'm going to be keying in on certain points for us to be mindful of as we're going through. So Mark 14, 32 through 34 says this, They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now there's a lot in this passage that we can certainly look to and pull out, but I want to, again, just kind of provide a few key points as we move forward. The first thing I think is really interesting and something for us to be well aware of is that in this moment of anxiety, in this moment of, of great distress, Jesus is very real with those friends around him. He is real with his community. He says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. So he's admitting that he's feeling very um, un uncertain, unsure of himself. He's feeling uh, really overwhelmed. And not only that, he's also asking his friends to be with him, to kind of rally around him, that he needs their support. So he's being really, really honest, really transparent and vulnerable with them in this moment. Craig Groeschel, who is a well-known pastor, uh, he's an author, uh, maybe he's a name that you know. He says it like this. One of the reasons you may be battling anxiety is because you are lacking community. And while that statement may not seem profound in and of itself, I think it's profound in its simplicity that it could be the simple fact that we don't have people around us that we're feeling anxious. We as a society, as a country, are suffering a great epidemic of loneliness. We are more connected in ways than we ever have been before, and yet there is a real sense of disconnection. Part of that is the fact that we just don't have friends who we can call on and who we can ask for support. I was listening to a podcast a while back, and uh, this professional was offering the idea of what she called a 4 a.m. friend a 4 a.m. friend and it's a really interesting concept it's not somebody who you would call at 4 a.m. in case of an emergency it's actually somebody you would call at 4 a.m. to just say how you're doing and to ask for their their help in that and their support in that and her claim was that if all of us had just one 4 a.m. friend one person that we could call at 4 a.m to basically share with them the feelings that they were that we were experiencing in that moment maybe that sense of anxiety and, and just being overwhelmed with it all if we had one 4 a.m friend that sense of loneliness that same sense of anxiety may actually be decreased significantly so my question to you is do you have a 4 a.m friend and if so 
who is that person? And if you don't have a 4 a.m. friend, who is it that you could call on? And what can you do to establish that kind of a relationship with someone? And we'll read from Mark 14, 35 through 36. He went on a little further and fell to the ground. This is Jesus. And he prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. It's really interesting that he is very raw with God in this moment. Again, I, I find it really intriguing that Jesus is feeling all the feelings. I think a lot of times we think that because of his perfection that he didn't feel any of the feelings, but in fact, he was fully human in this moment. And he teaches us what it's like or what it can be like to be fully human when it comes to the perfection that God wants for us. And we may not experience it because of the brokenness of this world, and yet we can still be a part of these practices that will draw us a bit closer to what that might be like. So again, Jesus is being very raw with God in this moment. In Luke 22:44, we read that Jesus prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Imagine that. Imagine just like being completely in the moment and for your body to actually be so a part of that, that it's producing great drops of sweat, almost like blood. In Philippines 4, 6, which is kind of our go-to, and it comes to worry and concern. We read that we should not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Again, just be raw with God. We know this from the Psalms as well. There's great lament there from David and the other psalmists. They're crying out and calling out to God, asking Him to be near to them, to make Himself known to them. They're, they're crying out in their repentance. They're crying out in their need for God and to be closer to Him. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. Again, a very simple passage, but one that we think, I think we can draw great strength from. Give all of it to God, because He cares for us. And he wants to know where we are at with things. He wants to hear from us. He wants to have that relationship with us. The third point I want to make is that Jesus is renewing to himself. I know that sounds maybe like an odd way of explaining, but renewal so often comes when we are willing to let go of something rather than holding on to it tighter, or pulling on it even harder. I think of it when I'm holding on to something for so long and my arms, my arm and my hands start to ache. They just can't hold on anymore. And so often the release of that is where you feel the renewal. It's the restoring nature of being able to kind of finally open your hand but that can be the scariest moment, can it? Where you're letting go and you feel like it's failure, but instead it's actually restorative. And it's, it's a sensation that you can only get by opening up your hands and receiving that energy back into your, into your arm, into your, into your hand. Renewal is to make like new, is to restore the freshness or the vigor and in Luke 22:42, we read, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Again, that is as, is as much of a, um, it's offering something to God, but it's also recognizing our limitations in the midst of it. Understanding that at some point, 
we do have to just give it over to God and to rely on and to believe in God's perfect plan and to believe that God wants the very best and has the very best in store for us. But that, that in itself, that practice of letting go and giving it over to God can be the hardest thing to, to let go of. But such anxiety comes as a result of us trying to do things in our own strength and in our own ways that we're so kind of tightly wound and bound that we forget to listen and to hear and to release and to let go. Where are you at with things? Where are you at in your renewal? Are you willing to let go so that you might be able to finally feel that restorative nature of God? The vigor being returned to you, you being restored. The fourth point I want to make is that Jesus was receptive to the Spirit's help. I want to make sure that I'm clear in saying this, that we are so anxious to do that, that we forget to stop and listen. We are so anxious that we forget to stop and listen. We're, we're so kind of aware of our own thoughts and our, our own concerns and our own worries that we forget to stop and listen. But when we slow down and quiet our hearts and our minds, then that is when we can be attentive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus is in a moment where he's about to enter the last stages of his time on earth. It's dark, it's late, his friends are asleep and Jesus feels very alone in this moment. But it's important for us to recognize what he does in this moment as much as what he is feeling. He retreats into prayer. He takes time to quiet his heart and his mind and to be in relationship with his Father in heaven. He's willing to stop and listen to what God would have to say because we say it so often, don't we, that his promptings come as whispers, not as uh, shouting or trying to overcome the busyness or the, the kind of the volume of our lives. It's a discipline that we need to come to. It's a kind of a position of humility when we're willing to stop and to listen to, and to be in prayer with God himself. And so Jesus does this. He quiets his heart and his mind. And what happens? Well, we're told that in Luke 22, 43, an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. And I don't necessarily think that it will always be that way for us. Maybe it will never be that way where we see an angel come and strengthen us. But I do believe that there is something that happens to us deep, deep down where things start to level out, where that uh, elevated heart rate starts to come down, where the breathing starts to come into line and we have kind of a more of a rhythm to the way that we're um, facing life. There's a little bit more of a sense of, of control in maybe uh, a situation where it feels like we're very much out of control. So the question is, how can you be receptive to the Spirit's help in your own lives? What are the things that you need to do or could do to be able to quiet your hearts and your minds in order to hear the quiet whispers of God, to, to hear the promptings, to recognize the promptings of the Spirit itself? Whatever it is, make the decision to commit to those things. Especially when times are difficult, not less when times are difficult. I think that is something that we do quite often as well, is that we run away from the things that we know are good for us, the disciplines and practices that we know are good for us. And so let us recommit ourselves to this renewed normal where we're able to kind of go back to the basics 
go back to the things that we are told are very good for us to do. In this case, be receptive to the Spirit's help. Renew yourselves, find ways to do that. Be raw with God and to be real with your community. And let's not slide back into normal. Instead, let's be changed by God. We have to remember that we've had a prolonged period of time where we have been told to isolate. We've been told to stay distant from each other, physically, socially speaking. And so we're all gonna have to spend a little bit of time kind of getting back into the routine of things and of being with one another. So my invitation to you is this one simple activity. What I would ask is for you to be the inviter. Instead of always being, or instead of always waiting to be invited, what if you were the one who was inviting? What if you were the one who was inviting people to a Zoom call? What if you were the one who was inviting somebody out to coffee or to lunch? What if you were somebody who was inviting a um, text conversation? What if you were the one who was pursuing the relationships that you need in your life? What if you were the one who was pursuing that 4 a.m. friend? Instead of waiting to be pursued, what if you flipped the script and you yourself pursued others? You might just find that there are some incredible people that you have never met before or some incredible people who you have met before but didn't know as well as you thought that you did. And so that's it. That's all I have for this go around with our study sessions. I want to thank you again for joining me and for being a part of this. If you haven't done so already and you wouldn't mind subscribing to our YouTube channel, that way you can be notified when new videos and new study sessions are made available. And I want to thank you for just taking the time to be a part of these conversations, which I hope are life-giving to you and are leading you to thinking about things in a different way. And hopefully they're leading you to have conversations with other people about these different topics. So with all of that, blessings to you until we see each other again and all the best. Thank you.